Yeah, today I want to uh, give kind of a high level lecture on uh, how quantum computers break cryptography and uh, what we are what we are doing about it. Uh, there will be more focus on the first part because I know um, there's a lot of local activity uh, working on the second part. Um, so let's get started. So in part one, we will talk about quantum computers. What are they? Um, what can they do? What can they not do? And uh, how do they break cryptographic protocols? And in the second part, we will talk a little bit about uh, post-quantum cryptography, which is basically the response to this threat. Let's get started with, uh, with the first part. So here's a picture of a couple of um, things we like to use every day. Um, um, I know that you know on this slide earlier in the middle there was uh, the Danish public uh, like digital public administration service, which I know is like used approximately um, 100 times more than uh, the digital functionality of the Personalausweis, but um, it's, it exists. <laughs> and uh, all these digital services are, of course, an under constant threat of uh, adversaries. I mean, just the digitalization of um, all kinds of services. Um, increases the attack surface because um, everything is uh, online. And uh, on the other hand, um, there's this exciting new technology called a quantum computer. Um, it doesn't exist yet, but there is an accelerating effort to uh, build it. Here's a couple of um, actors that are pouring uh, a lot of money into it. And these are both public and private actors. But what I especially like is the fact that uh, the United States has a national quantum coordination office and it has a seal, which has uh, an eagle in a bracket, in a quantum, like Dirac notation bracket as a symbol. Um, and therefore, we need to prepare cryptography for the arrival of uh, quantum computers, whatever that means, right? In particular, we need to make sure that cryptographic algorithms are still secure against quantum attacks. And eventually, I guess, we, if we want to uh, include quantum computers in our infrastructure, we will need to secure them as well, um, cryptographically. So that means, basically, if, if we take this as a picture of cryptography as a field, um, we need to kind of change a couple of things. There's a lot of things that can potentially become quantum. Um, in particular, there will be quantum computers running cryptographic protocols. There will be security against quantum attackers, which is called post-quantum security. And there's a couple of uh, interesting functionality that one can only construct from uh, mid with quantum means. This is what I call quantum enhanced crypto. And of course, if we then have like a couple of aspects of cryptography that become quantum, we also need to update the theoretical foundation of cryptography to accommodate quantum uh, theory. Of all these things, of course, the most important and pressing thing is post-quantum cryptography because it needs to be in place before um, quantum computers become a reality. Now, um, I want to spend a little bit of time to explain what a quantum computer is because I know um, that here at CASA there's um, a, a wide um, variety of, or like there, there's a lot of fields represented in particular more um, uh, hardware, uh, security, uh, etc. Et so some people um, might be um, very far and um, professionally from from quantum computers. Um, so quantum physics itself is it's everywhere, right? I mean, uh, all the technology we use uses quantum physics. Like we could not have constructed um, transistors or flash memory, um, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, without quantum physics. But these are um, like quantum physical devices that are used for processing, I guess, non-quantum or classical uh, information. But information is physical, as uh, Rolf Landauer, one of the uh, founding fathers of the information age, uh, has said. And if the information is physical, then, uh, sorry, if, if, yeah, if, if, if physics is quantum, then information, of course, is also quantum. And if information quantum is, is, is quantum, then why shouldn't we uh, compute with quantum information, right? Um, to understand what a quantum computer is, and in particular also to um, uh, understand a little bit of the, of, of, of the quirks of quantum computation in, uh, in how we formalize it, let me quickly 
try to uh, give like a one slide recap of what a classical computer is. So, um, right, it's a digital computing machine. Um, here is a couple of elements that it uses. This is, for example, a, a flash memory element, this kind of floating gate uh, transistor. Here's a, a circuit for an AND gate. And these, these kind of elements, they are then combined to form our computer, like this one, uh, which um, is the architecture of such a computer is called the modified uh, Howard art architecture, and it has a, a different elements like a control unit, arithmetic logic unit, memories, caches, input outputs. Um, so there's a, this is kind of a complex beast. And in theory, we model all of this using a, a Turing machine. Um, this is this is a, a physical model of a, a Turing machine. So a Turing ma machine has this tape. It models everything uh, except the processor. So basically it models uh, uh, memories, caches, input outputs, um, and uh, only the actual computation happens there in the middle. Um, I wanted to emphasize this to be able to contrast it to a quantum computer. So uh, quantum computing technology um, is in its infancy, but there's a couple of proposals of, uh, of how to construct a quantum computer. Uh, one proposal is using superconducting electronics. So um, in a superconductor, um, all the, the electrons form pairs and uh, that uh, prepares them to be able to populate the same quantum state, uh, like a microscopic number of electrons populate then the, the, the same quantum state. And uh, this is basically then the quantum uh, state that, that one can compute with um, at a high level. Another proposal is to use uh, photons. So um, of course, light is, is somehow uh, fundamentally quantum because it's, um, it's massless. Um, we cannot make it classical in, in, in a meaningful sense. Um, so that, that's a natural proposal to, to use that uh, and optical elements for, for quantum computation. Um, a third proposal is to use cold atoms. So if we have uh, atoms, then they have a ground state and excited states. So if we cool them down to um, very close to the absolute zero temperature, then we can kind of try and control the state, the internal state of the atoms and uh, use these degrees of freedoms for uh, quantum computation. And finally, there's also another proposal very closely related where we trap uh, ionized atoms instead of um, neutral atoms. Now, um, uh, one thing to observe is that all these architectures, they don't distinguish between memory on the one hand and, 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 uh, and, and computation or processors on the other hand. Um, there's just um, registers and they are used to uh, compute and to store information. Therefore, um, it's kind of natural that we use as a theoretical model for quantum computation, the circuit model. So there, um, instead of having something like a Turing machine that has a, a kind of an input output and memory system and on the one hand and a, a processor system on the other hand, here we just have registers and gates on, um, on these registers. Um, just as a, an additional side remark, um, of course there is efforts to build something like a quantum memory but it seems to be very hard, uh, much harder than even, even at that stage where we don't even have a quantum computer, it seems to be much harder uh, to build a quantum memory than uh, a quantum processor. Okay, so now a little bit more, um, more uh, let's say theoretical detail of uh, what's the difference between classical and quantum computing is. So classical computing has as internal states uh, in general bit strings it can be represented as a bit string and the same holds for reversible classical computation um, in quantum computation the internal state of a quantum computer is described by um, by a vector in a high dimensional complex vector space in terms of fundamentally speaking what operation can be in principle implemented uh, on a classical ah, sorry I, I first wanted to give one example of a, of a quantum state um, so this is um, a quantum state on, on this uh, space, and it's a, it's a superposition of different bit strings. In terms of operations, we can implement um, on a classical compute, uh, computer, fundamentally speaking, we can implement any function from n bits to m bits. On a reversible uh, computer, we can 
basically implement any permutation of the n-bit strings. And on a quantum computer, um, we can implement um, any linear operation that preserves the norm of these vectors, which is called a unitary. So here's an example. Uh, one thing we can, we can do is we can compute a reversible classical operation in superposition. Basically, we can define a unitary that implements this permutation, and we could, that can then uh, apply more generally to any superposition of bit strings. Now, we kind of have a little bit of an idea of um, what quantum computing is or what a quantum computer is, but what is it good for? Um, so here's a couple of potential applications of uh, quantum computation. So um, one of them is to simulate quantum systems. So on a classical computer, simulating quantum systems is very expensive and infeasible for larger systems. And the hope is to use a quantum computer that's kind of um, naturally more adapted to simulating quantum systems uh, for that task. Then another one, and that's basically the, the, the reason for, the, for this talk, is that it can be used to break cryptographic algorithms. Um, and finally, there's also some uh, proposals how to use it for optimization, but these are it's much more unclear whether this um, actually will, um, will become uh, faster than, than classical optimization at any time. In the following, we want to focus on, um, of course, on breaking cryptographic schemes. Um, so first of all, which schemes are uh, quantum vulnerable? And I'm, um, I'm pretty sure that most of you already know which these are. So these are the RSA um, crypto system and the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And of course, that's a bit frightening because these are all the public key crypto algorithms that we are currently using, uh, where they all, all has an asterisk because um, there's, of course, like, you know, uh, proof of concept or, or small deployments of, of other schemes. But uh, in the big picture, that's true. Um, of course, the question is, where are these schemes? And they are uh, essentially everywhere. So, for example, when we pay by card, when we use this uh, electronic public administration, if anybody does, then <laughs> then um, uh, then we, we use uh, broken schemes, quantum broken schemes. Of course, in HTTPS, when um, in, in the Bluetooth protocol, in secure instant messaging, uh, also some um, technologies with questionable value to humanity, like uh, Bitcoin. Um, military communication, I guess, RFID, uh, the Internet of Things, and then also um, the one technology where we might be uh, happy if uh, the cryptographic algorithms could be broken, and that's uh, ransomware. Um, now, yeah, these are a lot of applications, and basically what, what one can say is the rule of thumb, of course, is that um, whenever a new secure connection is established or something is publicly verifiable, then probably some quantum broken scheme is used. Now, um, as an, uh, we, I want to look at one example a bit more in detail, and that's uh, the TLS protocol, which is the cryptographic core of HTTPS. So, um, sorry, this is um, basically, I made this last slide a couple of, uh, I guess, a year ago or something. Um, so I connected to the website of, of my institution, DTU, and I checked what kind of encryption does the, um, the connection use. And now we will break down this, uh, this in TLS protocol into its part. So um, the TLS protocol consists of a handshake, which is an authenticated key exchange, and a session, which is authenticated encryption. Um, so that part here uses the block cipher AES, and the handshake uses, um, in this case, uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange and a digital signatures game, RSA digital signatures. So this um, Diffie-Hellman key exchange is secure if the uh, Diffie-Hellman problem is hard. And um, the RSA digital signature scheme is kind of use, use hash and sign. And the plain RSA digital signature scheme is secure if the RSA problem is hard. Now, um, unfortunately, um, quantum computers uh, imply that, that these are not hard. So basically, this tree of protocols just rots from the leaves 
and um, we are left without a handshake in um, in uh, TLS. Now comes the interesting part, and that's, or of course, the uh, other parts are also interesting, but now comes the really interesting part, and that's uh, also for me to explain, and that's how does a quantum computer break cryptographic algorithms? And I want to look at the example of RSA. Um, so RSA is based on the hardness of factoring. So of course, multiplication is easy. Everybody can do this, this as well. And if you have a lot of time and a lot of paper, you can also do this one, uh, compute this multiplication. However, factoring is hard, right? I mean, this is maybe still possible for this one, I would need to think. And I think for humans, this, this one is, is, is not, uh, not is, is basically infeasible. And uh, once we maybe look at a, um, a composite number that's six times as long as this one, then it becomes hard for a, com a computer. And in RSA, the factors are um, a private key and the product is the public key. So of course, if we can factor, we can compute the private key from the public key and break the scheme. Now, factoring is hard on a classical computer, but it turns out that uh, factoring is not hard on a quantum computer. This is, by the way, a picture of a, a prototype quantum computer. Um, so how does it work? How does a quantum computer factor integers? Um, so here is an algorithm for factoring. Um, the problem is uh, given a number n that's not prime, find some divisor of it, right? That's not uh, one or the number itself. Um, to do this, we pick a random um, integer in between the two numbers. And first we start by computing the greatest common divisor between these two numbers. Um, if that's not one, um, then we are already done, right? But most likely this will not happen, especially if n is an RSA um, integer. Now, otherwise we define this function that maps x to a to the power x. So x is here an integer, and we just exponentiate a uh, to the power x modulo uh, n. And then we find uh, the period of this function. So we find a number r such that f of x plus r is equal to f of x. Um, now we hope that r is even and uh, that it's not minus one, that, that basically a to the r half is not minus one. These are two conditions that are, um, uh, that are fulfilled in, with good probability over our choice of, r, uh, of a. And then um, we output the greatest common divisor of a to the r half minus one and n. And this turns out to be guaranteed to be a non-trivial divisor of n. Now that's a great algorithm and there's no, nothing quantum in it, right? But there's one problem here. And that's, I didn't tell you how to find this uh, period, right? And this will be basically of the order uh, of the uh, RSA modulus. Um, in particular, it will be extremely hard to find this period. And if I would try to do this on a classical computer, I would end up with a factoring algorithm that's much worse than, um, than the optimal or the best known factor factoring algorithm. That, are, um, that run on a classical computer. So the problem of finding the period of a function is called period finding. So now how does, um, does one find a period, right? So um, let me show you one um, way of finding a period. So uh, because I wanted to be low, uh, like or wanted to be light on mathematics, I want to draw pictures instead. Um, so probably many of you know the Fourier transform. Um, so the Fourier transform is some, uh, some transformation that transforms functions into functions. So let me draw graphs of functions. For example, it draws, uh, it, it transforms Gaussians to Gaussians. And um, if, um, if the Gaussian is uh, much narrower here, then it becomes wider here. Um, and it basically uh, one function that that in the continuous case cannot be uh, Fourier transformed is a periodic function. I mean, at least it doesn't output a function the Fourier transform. If I try to still think of the Fourier transform of a periodic function, then I get something that basically at um, the periods and I, I can at least imagine that the that, that simple sine function um, that I approximately drew um, transforms into something that's 
very large or infinite um, at the period and minus the period and zero elsewhere. Now, if we go away from this continuous case, we can look at the dis discrete Fourier transform. So we can look at um, the Fourier transform of functions that are only defined on uh, discrete values and everything stays essentially the same. So for example, if I take a discretized Gaussian that's, uh, that, that, you know, that becomes very small before my finite domain of this discrete uh, function ends, then the picture is still the same. In particular, what's nice is that if I discretize this one and my discretization kind of fits with the period, then um, this picture here actually becomes accurate. So um, if, also, if, if my domain is an integer multiple of the period, then uh, this picture becomes accurate. So I get um, basically, maybe now you can imagine that um, the domain is only the positive numbers, then I will basically get something that's non-zero only at the value of, of the period. And um, if, if not everything is, is perfect as here, then it's, this uh, picture still approximately holds. So now, um, basically, the idea is um, this is a, a function that's defined on a huge domain. So computing it would be uh, at every value would be hard. Computing the Fourier transform would take a long time. But what if I could basically find an algorithm to sample a random point of the Fourier do domain with the probability being proportional to the, to the value of the Fourier transform? If I could do this, then I could uh, basically find the period, right? Because our Fourier transform of the periodic function is um, essentially only non-zero at the value of the period, or maybe some multiples of it. Um, so this leads basically to the problem of Fourier sampling. So here's a, a problem description, basically given black box action, uh, access to a function um, from the bit strings to the complex numbers, sample an n-bit string k from a probability distribution such that the distribution, the probability to output k is proportional to the Fourier transform uh, of f at the value k. Actually, I should have written the square because that's what a quantum computer can do, the square of the Fourier transform at the value k. But um, yeah, that, uh, that's a typo. Um, so, it turns out that a quantum computer can do this. And uh, what is the reason? Basically, I, as I told you earlier, the quantum computer's uh, state space is this um, two to the n dimensional complex vector space. So a vector in two to the n dimensions, I can equivalently view this as a function from uh, on a domain with two to the n, uh, of size two to the n with complex outputs. So if I can basically put my function from the n-bit strings into the complex numbers as a state into the quantum computer, then uh, it turns out that I can compute the Fourier transform of this function in some sense um, on n qubits instead of basically on two to the n, order two to the n uh, classical bits. Um, so that's great. So here is basically my cartoon slide for quantum Fourier slans, uh, sampling. So um, in a classical computer, we have bits and Fourier sampling needs to have at least uh, an order L, at least to take at least time order L, where L is kind of the number of elements in our domain of, of the function. However, on a quantum computer, we can uh, do Fourier sampling in uh, time order log L if, um, that there's some conditions basically that con are connected to whether we can uh, put our function in, into, the, in, into a quantum state. It depends uh, kind of a bit on the details. But it turns out basically the function that comes from, um, from the factoring problem is amenable to this. So this is how uh, Shor's algorithm factors, um, factors uh, integers. Now, um, as a last, for, for the last part of um, the quantum computing uh, threat to cryptography part, I want talk, to talk a little bit about assessing the risk um, that uh, quantum computers pose to our um, IT infrastructure or to our uh, computer security infrastructure. 
So um, here's a picture of how to do this kind of uh, a basic form of this risk, risk assessment, right? So um, there's a number three quantities that are important. Uh, the kind of lifetime of our data, how long do we need our data to be uh, securely encrypted, for example? Um, then uh, another value, why here, how long does it take for us to change our infrastructure to something that is uh, quantum secure? And then of course, a very, the, a very important quantity is also, when will we have a quantum computer that's able to break uh, cryptography? Because nowadays we don't have it. We, have, we don't have uh, um, a, quam, a quantum computer yet in, the, uh, in any uh, meaningful sense of the, of the world, word. So then, of course, if the sum of x and y is larger than z, then we should worry. Now, how big are these, uh, these quantities? So for y, um, I think it's instructive to look at some other kind of transitions, uh, or let's say forced transitions of infrastructure. For example, uh, the transition from the WEP protocol to the uh, WPA protocol for, um, for Wi-Fi encryption, um, it took a very long time. And um, I mean, even now, probably it would be um, it would be wrong to say that that uh, the transition has been completed. I think it has been completed for all um, like high value targets. Uh, that that was probably faster than other things. But um, it takes a long time to um, change infrastructure, in particular if it's on this kind of um, uh, system where it's not a general purpose computer, but uh, some router. Um, so how long is X like? How long should we keep our data secure? This is of course a soft question and it's not, not easy to answer, but um, I mean, it's, maybe it's instructive to think about what happens if the data is uh, covered by GDPR. Um, my guess would be like, if you want to be sure not to get sued, you want that uh, basically the person about who the data is, is dead by the time uh, that the encryption gets broken. That would mean that we need to set X to a human lifespan. That's of course very long, um, but for other things, it's maybe also um, easy to get uh, to an estimate. This is of course not my expertise. So um, take this with a, with a grain of salt. Um, now the, the last quantity Z is probably the hardest to estimate, of course, because this is about development of a new technology and this can go slower in the future than it has gone in the past. It could be faster in the future than it has gone in the past. Um, I guess the best thing we can do is we can ask the experts and that's um, what uh, Mike Mosca and uh, Mark Piani did for the Global Risk Institute. They interviewed um, 46 experts uh, and tried to uh, ask them to basically estimate or, or give a guess for the likelihood that a quantum computer then can, that can factor a 2048-bit RSA, RSA integer uh, in a certain, you know, after five years, 10 years, 15 years, et cetera. So here's the resulting graph. Um, and we can look at it and see that there's a sizable crowd of experts that think um, it's at least somewhat likely that um, after 15 years from now, uh, we have um, a quantum computer that can do that. And uh, the picture becomes fairly clear after 30 years, there's basically only one expert left that thinks the likelihood is less than 50%. So this concludes the first part of the talk. Uh, so to summarize, um, quantum computers are fundamentally different from regular computers, um, and they are currently not available. Um, the time horizon, uh, according to experts, is at least something like 10 to 30 years. Um, they are good at uh, discovering certain kinds of, of structure in big mathematical objects, and that's basically what enables them to break um, cryptographic algorithms like RSA and Diffie-Hellman. Okay, let's move on to the second part. And that's about uh, post-quantum uh, public key cryptography. So um, in the last uh, many years, there was this uh, standardization process ongoing for uh, post-quantum public key cryptography. And that's what I want to talk about a little in the, in the beginning here. Um, 
So A and Diffie Hellman are, are dead, but of course there are other ways to um, construct public key encryption. It can be, for example, also based on uh, the hardness of lattice problems, solving uh, systems of multivariate polynomial equations, decoding obfuscated and quotation mark error correction codes, and um, also on the problem of finding uh, isogenies between super singular ellip elliptic curves. So there is some biodiversity of assumptions that we can base um, public key encryption on. So um, for all of these cases, uh, public key encryption has been constructed. And um, in fact, digital signatures are, are in, in a very precise sense easier to construct than public key encryption. So in addition to uh, digital signatures based on these algorithms uh, or, or these uh, problems, we can also have digital signatures that are constructed from hash functions. And also um, there's a somewhat newer proposal that's called MPC in the head signatures, which is also uh, a construction of digital signatures that is based on symmetric key uh, primitives. In fact, there's already a standard that's quantum secure and that's um, the XMSS stateful uh, digital signature scheme. However, um, digital signatures is not what we are worried about, right? Because somehow um, in digital signature, the, the, the adversary that we are um, worried about is a forging adversary that forges a signature. So it needs to be kind of, um, um, there's, there's not this future aspect of security. I mean, the forgery needs to happen now to have an impact. And we are fairly sure that now there doesn't exist quantum computers. But for encryption, of course, um, things that are encrypted now should not be possible to decrypt later. So uh, while digital signatures are easier to construct, they are also kind of less critical in, uh, with respect to the quantum computing threat. Now, um, in this NIST standardization process, the goal was to um, standardize at least um, a key encapsulation mechanism and a digital signature scheme. Uh, and Initially, all the classes were represented in the standardization process. Um, now, an announcement has been made in summer to, to, uh, to standardize a couple of schemes. One uh, lattice-based key encapsulation mechanism uh, and three digital signature schemes, two of them lattice-based. And uh, of course, two of the pro uh, proposals come partially out of this house. So um, I will not uh, um, uh, go on about these. But let me just say that there's, a, there's also a fourth round, which has a new call for digital signatures. And um, it also uh, is the plan to standardize at least one uh, code-based uh, key encapsulation mechanism. The reason for this is, of course, that, um, um, that it's wise to not put all our eggs in one basket. So this is just for hedging against um, uh, basically uh, against possible breaks of these um, a fairly new technologies like uh, the algebraic lattices that are underlying uh, Kyber and the lithium, for example. Okay, great. So we are, we are going to have a standard and then we basically can repair our tree and I will not rebuild it from there, but I bas I'm basically in the, what will be in the handshake, I guess, is um, a Kyber uh, key encapsulation mechanism with uh, the lithium digital signatures. Now um, I want to lose, use the last um, maybe um, 15 minutes or so um, to basically um, switch gears and describe a little bit how quantum uh, computing techniques are not only useful to kind of uh, investigate in how far cryptographic algorithms are broken by quantum algorithms, but they are also necessary for uh, providing provable security for um, for post-quantum algorithms. So in which situations are quantum techniques needed for provable security? I mean, it has been a little bit of a, um, I don't know, like a mood or a folklore that for many cases, it should just be fine uh, to, to basically make sure that the algorithms are based on assumptions that are not broken by quantum computers. And then basically the, the security reductions, they should, they should probably be fine. But there's just a couple of um, situations and probably I don't have a complete list where um, 
security proofs need quantum techniques. So one of these situations is when we are in a model where um, we where we basically uh, model a certain underlying primitive as a black box that the adversary has access to. In this case, um, if this is a, a public primitive, we need to assume that an, a quantum attacker implements this public primitive on their quantum computer. So we need to allow quantum access to the black box primitive that we replaced it with. Another situation is when we are rewinding adversaries. Um, so in, in some uh, security proofs for, uh, for example, interactive proof systems or digital signatures, um, the security argument takes an adversary, uh, lets, lets it run until the end, then it basically runs it backwards until an intermediate state changes some uh, interactive input and runs it again forward. And this is not something that easily can be uh, done with a quantum algorithm. Um, a third setting is if we are looking at non-black box reductions. So this is, of course, a bit more esoteric or maybe not, uh, not so relevant for, um, for uh, basic cryptographic schemes that we want to use in, in the real world. But um, if we're looking at more uh, involved constructions, um, sometimes we need to basically, we need the reduction to look at the code of the adversary and uh, perform operations on it. And in this case, if the, uh, if the adversary is quantum, then this code will be, of course, uh, a quantum circuit. So uh, there's probably more situations, but these are the ones that I could come up with while I um, uh, prepare this talk. And I want to now give uh, a little bit more detail about this first setting, because it's uh, relevant for um, even for the setting of very basic cryptographic algorithms like uh, key encapsulation and uh, digital signatures. So the most um, common case where we use this uh, black boxification of uh, a fundamental cryptographic primitive is the case of hash functions. So hash function is just this kind of digest function. It maps a, some arbitrary amount of data to a small hash value. And it's everywhere in cryptography, for example, for digital signatures or strong security for encryption, um, we, we, we use these hash functions. But somehow the security of hash functions itself is, is a bit annoying. It's annoying to formalize, um, especially for real world hash functions, it's, it's, um, it's, it's difficult to formalize. And uh, if we then uh, succeed in formalizing some uh, security property for this hash function, then often some other security property turns out to be not enough to prove security. Um, so um, giving up is not an option. We need crypt uh, cryptography and it needs to be efficient. So instead, we just move to this fantasy land, which is called the random Oracle model. So here's a comparison of the reality and the model. In the reality, we have some algorithm. It's on Wikipedia. Anybody can implement it. Um, in the model, we just assume that instead of this algorithm, uh, we have a uniformly random function. And all agents uh, adversarial or honest have or Oracle access to this function. This is of course outrageously op optimistic um, that, that our real world function should behave in that way. And it's actually provably wrong. I mean, basically one can give examples of kind of contrived artificial constructions that are secure in the random Oracle model and that are broken whatever concrete and polynomial time computable function we instantiate um, the hash function with. However, it seems to work in practice and it enables very efficient crypto. So we, we will just still use it until basically some practical scheme uh, breaks in the random Oracle model. Uh, it's secure in the random Oracle model and breaks in, in practice. So if we are now using to quantum, uh, post-quantum security, uh, we need to consider the fact that this is a publicly specified algorithm which can be implemented on a quantum computer. So basically the, the minimum adjustment is that we at least um, give all agents uh, quantum Oracle access to this hash function or to this random function that we model the hash function with. And this leads to the definition of the uh, quantum accessible random Oracle model. Now, of course, um, if we have an algorithm that uh, has that basically interacts with such a quantum accessible oracle and then um, solves some cryptographic task, 
and we want to use it for a security reduction, we need to basically um, accept that this reduction will be quantum because it, it will use basically the quantum input output behavior of the algorithm when interacting with the Oracle. And if we want to look at certain tasks and perform kind of generic uh, cryptanalysis of hash function constructions, um, then we also look, need to look low at the uh, quantum query complexity. So basically how many quantum queries do I need to uh, perform to solve a certain task with respect to this random function? Um, now, um, as a last um, little um, extra, I want to give a couple of examples, actually two examples where um, this kind of post-quantum security in this kind of an idealized situation is important. The first one is uh, the so-called Fujisaki Okamoto transformation, which is a transformation kind of a generic recipe how to upgrade the security of a basic public key encryption scheme to a strongly secure key encapsulation mechanism. I mean, the original Fujisaki Okamoto transformation was constructing uh, just another PKE, but a, ver a variant of it um, can be used to construct a key encapsulation mechanism. Um, Another example is the Fiat-Shamir transformation. So this is a, also a generic construction uh, of a digital signature scheme um, based on an interactive proof system of a certain kind. So these two um, transformations, they are um, extremely important. Um, in particular, the um, Fujisaki Okamoto transformation is used in Kyber, which will be standardized. And the Fiat-Shamir transformation at least a, a certain variant of it, which is called Fiat Shamir with the boards, um, is used in the lithium, the, uh, the digital, one of the digital signature schemes that is being standardized. So basically, um, it's because of that, it's extremely important that we have a post quantum security uh, proof for these uh, constructions. Now, um, if we Think back, I, I don't remember exactly when the NIST competition was started, but um, it, it was definitely at least um, five, six years ago, seven, I don't know, um, a long time ago. And at that time, um, uh, the, the, the provable security of these uh, two constructions was really not, uh, not in good order, at least in the case of the uh, Fujisaki Okamoto transformation. And it was just um, a completely unknown for the Fiat Shamir transformation. Now for the future mere transformation, um, the post quantum security was only proven in 2019. And actually um, these results, they um, basically came as a surprise to, to many because there were even some uh, kind of barrier results that, uh, that kind of assumed a certain structure of a security reduction, post quantum security reduction for the future mere transformation and proved that such a structured um, um, reduction cannot exist. In the case of Fujisaki Okamoto, um, the first results about it were, were much earlier, um, but these were always for kind of modifications of the original transformation. And um, it took a long time until um, a somewhat nice proof for the original variant of the Fujisaki Okamoto transformation was uh, provided. In particular, for example, um, in Kyber, the, the scheme that will now be standardized, uh, um, a variant of this Fujisaki Okamoto transformation is used that's called uh, non um, implicit reject, it's called. Basically, um, the chem in the end will not uh, give an error symbol when um, the decapsulation function has uh, failed. It will instead, instead just pretend nothing happened and output kind of a, an independent pseudo random key. Um, and this is um, at least in part an artifact of um, earlier proofs um, only supporting this variant, at least the efficient proofs. There's also still some open questions uh, in, in the case of Fujisaki Okamoto, uh, especially relating to um, tightening the proofs. So here's a summary of the post-quantum part. Um, so NIST is standardizing post-quantum crypto uh, schemes, and there's a good biodiversity of assumptions that we can build post-quantum secure crypto on. 
Uh, and quantum theory is indeed needed for uh, proving the security of post-quantum cryptography. That's all I had. Thanks for listening.